This is Track 2 of Lecture 3 in the series Inflation and Price Controls. Reducing the costs of production means, for the most part, that one finds a way to produce the same amount of a good with less labor. This acts to increase production because it makes labor available to produce more of this good or more of other goods somewhere else in the economic system. The saving of labor is clearest in the case in which the businessman achieves the cost reduction by employing labor-saving machinery. <clears throat> but even if the cost reduction is achieved by finding a way to use less of some material or a less costly material, labor will also be saved. Because if less of the material is required, less labor is required to produce the smaller quantity of the material. If a less costly material is required, it is probable that labor will be saved, since it is probable that the less costly material is less costly because less labor is required to produce it. To this extent, then, saving costs means saving labor and therefore making the means available for increasing production. Now, even if a saving in the quantity of labor is not involved in a cost reduction, the ability to produce something with a less costly material or with less costly labor, for that matter, say, unskilled labor in place of skilled labor, still brings about a net increase in aggregate production. Because what happens in these cases is that the more costly material or labor is released to expand the production of something else, which is comparatively important, while the less costly material or labor that replaces it is withdrawn from the production of something else, which is comparatively unimportant. The principle here is perhaps best illustrated by the case of employing nurses and other aides for many of the tasks that would otherwise have to be performed by doctors. What is gained is the added work that can only be performed by doctors, and which otherwise would have been impossible for lack of availability of doctor's time. What is lost is only the work that the nurses or whoever might have performed as secretaries, bookkeepers, or whatever. Every substitution of less costly labor for more, co for more costly labor is comparable to this case in its effect. And the same applies to the substitution of less costly for more costly materials. In this way, a net economic gain equivalent to an increase in production takes place because the production of something more important is increased at the expense of the production of something less important. Now, the correct anticipation of changes in consumer demand is also a necessary part of the process of increasing production. To understand this point, we must realize that increases in production are one of the most important causes of wide-ranging changes in the pattern of consumer spending. For example, the steady improvements in agriculture and the consequent drop in the proportion of people's incomes that has had to be tied up in buying food has made possible a continuously growing demand for the whole range of industrial goods. Similarly, the introduction and development of the automobile brought about far-reaching shifts in demand. It made possible the development of the suburbs and a whole host of new businesses from gas stations to motels it expanded the demand for other businesses, such as ski resorts, reduced the demand for passenger railroads and horses, and virtually destroyed the businesses of buggy making and blacksmithing. Every improvement in production exercises a similar, if less dramatic, effect on the spending for other goods. Now, in order for these spending shifts to be accompanied by corresponding shifts of production, and in many cases, even to take place at all, it is necessary for wide-ranging shifts in the investment of capital to occur. 
thus to continue with the examples of agriculture and the automobile, capital had to be diverted from agriculture to industry, from cities to suburbs, from railroads, horse breeding, buggy making, and blacksmithing, to automaking, gas stations, motels, and ski resorts, and so on. <clears throat> to the extent that the appropriate shifts of capital did not occur, or occurred with undue delay, the benefit from the improvement in production was lost. For example, to the extent that capital was not shifted out of farming rapidly enough, as a result of government farm subsidies or the inertia of many farmers, the effect of the improvements in agriculture was limited to a relatively unwanted increase in agricultural production and correspondingly less of an increase in much more desired industrial production. <clears throat> Similarly, to the extent that capital would not have been shifted rapidly enough out of buggy making and horse breeding, the benefits from the automobile would have been held down. Capital would have been wasted in buggy making and horse breeding, which would have been employed with infinitely greater benefit in any of the new or expanding industries brought about by the automobile. In all such cases, the failure to make the appropriate shifts of capital is to lose some or all of the benefit of the improvement in production. For this reason, the correct anticipation of changes in consumer demand is an integral part of the process of increasing production. Now, to summarize our discussion of the free market thus far, we may say the following. The desire of businessmen to earn profits and avoid losses, and to earn higher profits in preference to lower profits, brings about a tendency toward a uniform rate of profit on capital invested in all the different branches of industry. The operation of this tendency counteracts, delimits, and largely prevents mistakes from being made in the relative production of the various goods. Because of it, consumers have the power of positive initiative to shift the course of production simply by changing the pattern of their spending. Because of the profit motive, businessmen are made to act virtually as the consumer's agents. The operation of the tendency toward a uniform rate of profit requires that high profits be made by continuously introducing productive innovations in advance of competitors. These innovations are the base of a continuous increase in production, whether they take the form of new and improved products reduced costs of production, or correct anticipations of changes in consumer demand. On the basis of all of this, we must conclude that the free market, operating through the profit motive, has been responsible for the tremendous success of the American economic system. It has ensured the maximum possible effort to introduce innovations and to extend their application as rapidly as possible, with the result that in comparatively short periods of time, revolutionary improvements have become commonplace. Because of this, and because of the rapid adaptation it assures to all changes in economic conditions, it has rendered every crisis, from natural disasters to wars to absurd acts of government, a mere temporary setback in a steady climb to greater prosperity. Now, before we conclude this evening's lecture, I would like to apply a little of what we have learned about the free market to a number of cases in which the free market does not presently exist in our country. A brief consideration of these cases will both illustrate the principle of the tendency of the rate of profit toward uniformity and provide a demonstration of the value to be gained by extending the free market. Let us begin with the case of government farm subsidies. Let us imagine that the government stopped buying up farm products to be stored or given away. And at the same time, reduced taxes 
to the extent of the reduction in its expenditures achieved by the abolition of the program. The effect would be a drop in the demand for farm products. But since the taxpayers would now have the money previously used to pay the subsidies, there would be a rise in the demand for a host of other products, products which the taxpayers judged would satisfy the most important of their needs or wants, which previously had to go unsatisfied. Such products as an extra room on a house, a newer or better car, extra education, and so on, depending on the needs and desires of the various individuals concerned. The immediate effect of this shift of demand would be to depress prices and profits in farming and to raise them in these various other industries. The further consequence would be a withdrawal of capital and labor from farming and their transfer to the production of these other goods. The movement of capital and labor out of farming would take place until the rate of profit in farming was raised back up to the general level and that of the various goods in additional demand by the taxpayers was brought down to the general level. Because until this result was achieved, incentives would exist for a further movement of capital and labor out of farming and into these other fields. When the process was finally completed, therefore, the rate of profit earned in farming would be on a par with the rate of profit earned everywhere else. Please observe, in accordance with the uniformity of profit principle, that it would simply not be possible for the rate of profit in farming to be permanently depressed. Now, it follows from this last fact that in the long run, those who remained in agriculture would tend to earn, on average, the same level of income they had earned before the repeal of the subsidies, some more, some less. Even the incomes of ex-farmers, once they acquired skills and abilities for industry, comparable to those they had possessed in agriculture, and so took full advantage of the new opportunities created for them in industry by the expansion of demand for industrial goods, even their incomes would come to be on a level comparable to what they were initially. The one vital difference that would now exist and which would be of benefit to everyone, farmers and ex-farmers included, would be that the taxation of everyone's income would be smaller and everyone would be enabled to buy more of the goods he himself desired. In other words, instead of everyone being forced to spend a part of his income through the government for the purchase of valueless farm goods to be uselessly stored or to be given away, he would be able to spend that part of his income for industrial goods of value and importance to his life. And those goods would be produced by the capital and labor previously employed in producing the farm products, or by capital and labor released from other employments by virtue of the substitution of capital and labor released from agriculture. I chose the example of farm subsidies to illustrate how the free market reacts when the profitability of an industry is initially rendered low. Farm subsidies, however, represent a different form of price controls than the kind we want to deal with in this series of lectures. Farm subsidies are a way the government achieves artificially high prices. They are an illustration of legal minimum prices, that is, prices below which the government prevents the producers from selling. They are comparable in their effects to minimum wage legislation. The kind of price controls that we want to focus on, however, are, of course, controls designed to keep prices artificially low, that is, legal maximum prices, or ceiling prices, as they are often called prices above which one is not allowed to sell. So let us take as a second major illustration of the uniformity of profit principle and of the value of extending the free market, the consequences that would follow if rent controls were repealed. To simplify this discussion, let us assume 
that the entire supply of rental housing in a given locality has been under controls. In this case, the first effect of the repeal of controls would simply be a jump in all rents. As a result of this jump, however, rental housing would again become profitable. In fact, as a result of previous inadequate building due to rent controls, extremely profitable. However, it is impossible that the rental housing industry should be permanently more profitable than other industries. The high rate of profit would be the incentive and would itself provide much of the means for expanded investment in the rental housing industry. There would be a building boom in rental housing. As a result, the supply of rental housing would be stepped up and the rents and the profitability of rental housing would begin to fall and would go on falling until the rate of profit in rental housing was no higher than the rate of profit in industry generally. The long-run effect of the repeal of rent control, therefore, would simply be an increase in the supply of rental housing. Rents themselves, in the long run, would be no higher than corresponded to the costs of constructing and operating apartment houses, with profits only enough to make the industry competitive. Exactly the same effects would follow the repeal of price controls on crude oil, natural gas, or any other good. That is, there would be a temporary surge in price and profit, followed by expanded production and a reduction in price and profit to the point where the price corresponded to the goods production cost and allowed only enough profit to make the goods production competitive. On the basis of what we have just seen, it should be obvious that the repeal of rent controls would act to end New York City's housing shortage and make possible an enormous improvement in the quantity and quality of housing for the average person in New York City. It should be equally obvious that the repeal of price controls on crude oil and on natural gas would act to expand energy supplies and make possible a return to America's traditional abundance and growth of energy supplies. In sum, it should already be clear, even at this stage of our knowledge, that the problems we are experiencing in all these areas are the result of controls and would be solved by the establishment of economic freedom. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Benswanger. Uh, that's a very good question. How is it, since all the money in the economy must be owned by somebody, when individuals are trying to reduce their cash balances, someone else's cash balance will necessarily increase? Well, what happens is the volume of transactions is increased to the point where, given this greater volume of transactions, people do need the cash to finance the larger volume of transactions. See, the cash is excessive in relation to a smaller volume of transactions, but it then produces a larger volume of transactions in relation to which it ceases to be excessive. Yes? You, know, you can say a, a total volume of spending. You see, the volume of spending is the prices of all of the different transactions times the quantity of goods or services involved. Now, in a, to make this concrete, suppose people had what they considered an excessive quantity of money for the moment. And imagine the government gave us each a new $100 bill. Everyone's cash balance would then probably be excessive by $100. So they begin to try to get rid of it. In the process of getting rid of it, they would start raising prices to the point where you would need an extra hundred dollars to transact your business. 
Yes, Mr. Hall. How does the government reduce the quantity of money? Well, if they wanted to reduce it, and on rare occasions, historically, governments have, they could conceivably collect taxes and burn part of the currency. <laughs> or they could reduce the, the Federal Reserve, for example, could sell something in the market which people would buy, and then the Federal Reserve could simply retire that money. But as a practical matter, such things are very rarely done. And so the, so the government is really not in the business of reducing the quantity of money, but of expanding it. What they may do, if they've expanded it too rapidly in the very recent past, they may cut back a little on their most recent expansion. Yes? I could I repeat Say's Law? Say's Law being the law named after the French economist Say. The most common statement of the law is that supply creates its own demand. What it means is supply creates purchasing power. Now, instead of my attempting to discuss Say's Law, which really takes me about an hour to give a good discussion of it, I would recommend something that you could read on the subject. The best exposition of Say's Law that I know of is by James Mill, who is the father of John Stuart Mill. And it is in a book called Selected Economic Writings of James Mill, edited by Donald Winch, W-I-N-C-H. And it appears in this book in the essay Commerce Defended. It's in the essay Commerce Defended in the chapters dealing with consumption and the national debt. Consumption and the national debt in the essay Commerce Defended in the book Selected Economic Writings of James Mill. And the law should really be called Mill's Law if you compare his exposition to that of Say. Yes? Uh, you've heard it stated that bad money drives out good money, which is known as Gresham's Law. And you ask, why is that necessarily true? Or is it necessarily true? And why is it true? Well, it is true only because the government forces you to treat good and bad money as equivalents. Now, let me give you a simple context in which bad money would not drive out good money, but would be driven out instead. Think of the United States silver coins, the pre-1965 silver coins that have disappeared. Now, the paper money has driven them out. Let us think why. It's because if you wanted to spend an old silver dime, the law allows you only to have that dime treated as the equivalent of an ordinary dime. It forces a silver dime, which has silver in it today, that is worth about 30 cents, to be accepted in commerce as though it's only worth 10 cents. Well, no one will spend as a dime something which is, in fact, worth 30 cents. See, the government is undervaluing this good money. But now, suppose the government allowed you to spend silver coins at their intrinsic value so that you could go into a supermarket, pay with a roll of dimes, a $5 roll of old silver dimes, would be accepted as the equivalent of $15 in the paper money or the new change. So imagine people could do that. Well, in those circumstances, the good money would start to drive out the bad. Because then people would see, look back 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I could buy a quantity of goods and pay for it with a $10 bill or a $10 roll of quarters. They were equivalent. Now that same batch of goods that used to cost me $10 of the paper cost $20. 
but it now only costs less than $10 in the silver. If a, if a roll of quarters is worth $30, which is what it's worth, then in terms of the silver quarters, those goods cost six sixty-seven. dollars See, people would observe that if you calculated prices in the silver coins, they've fallen. They've only risen in terms of the paper. Then they begin to wonder, well, what's wrong with the paper? And then they'd start to want to use the metallic money, not the paper. So if the government did not interfere, if it allowed metallic money to pass at its intrinsic value, then good money would drive out bad. Are there any other? Mr. Schwartz? Did prices rise from 1933 to 1945 while velocity was decreasing? Yes, they did, because even though velocity was decreasing, the total volume of spending was still increasing and more than production. Well, I don't know that that would be a refutation of it. Yeah. You mean that showing that in that period the quantity of money had to be an even bigger factor? All right, if you look at it that way, if you say that even when velocity falls, the quantity of money was raising prices, all right, I guess you could say that. Yes? question is, do I believe the economists of today are misinformed or dishonest? And do I believe the economists of West Germany are better? I would say that the major problem is that there are very, very few economists in the United States or, or anywhere else. So economics is really not what you read in Samuelson or Bach or what have you. That's a fast song and dance act to show that, that they have read, that they have some superficial knowledge of economics. By economics, I mean the science that was propounded by people like Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Von Bavrik, Von Mises. This is a science which has largely become a lost science. Economics was influential as a science in the 19th century, but in our century, it is one of the things that has disappeared from public knowledge. If you want to learn about economics, you have to read the great economists. Now, if you ask, are there people in West Germany, are there more people in West Germany who know something about economics than in the United States? I would hesitate to say definitely yes, but it is true that there is a group of economists in West Germany who do know something, and they realize the importance of knowing something, perhaps better than we do, because they, they lived through the Nazi regime, and you, I, I read, for example, while we had price controls on oil, one of the leaders of the Social Democratic Party, no less, was saying that you have to be mad to abandon the price system because they learned what the consequences were under the Nazis. So perhaps there is some group that realizes that the government should not act as though it had omnipotence but I would hesitate to say that the general level of knowledge is greater there than here. This gentleman in the far back. Is there any countervailing effect because interest rates in savings accounts are increased? 
when interest rates in savings accounts rise, that would be one of the ways that the desire to hold money falls. Because when interest rates in savings accounts rise, it then becomes more worthwhile for people to shift funds out of their checking accounts into their savings accounts. See, if interest rates were very low, it doesn't make very much difference to put money in a savings account rather than a checking account. But as they get higher, then it does. <clears throat> yes? With the fact that some industries are more capital intensive than other industries. For example, the electric utility industry is more capital intensive than the restaurant business. Would that have an effect in slowing down the flow of capital? I mean, would it perhaps take a longer time to provide enough additional capital for some industries than for other industries? because they needed more capital? I suppose it would. Yes? If you ask, don't I think that we have to change our values? Uh, now, you see, when I say that the consumers can control the course of production, they certainly can. But when you talk about changing our values, I don't think that the consumers have to change their values unless they see some reason why they should. But I would agree that we would have to change our values in some respects, namely to stop holding up as an ideal any form of asceticism or any form of criticism of the desire of people to improve their standard of living. I think we should adopt as our value that it is a perfectly valid, rational concern and should be our leading concern that we peacefully proceed to increase our standard of living. We should jettison all those values that we now have that make us apologize in any way for being concerned with a rising standard of living. We should get rid of those values that hold it as some kind of ideal that we should live with a sackcloth and ashes or sacrifice our lives and well-being. In other words, the values that we should uphold, we should have philosophical values that match the values that the consumers have. The, the, you, the consumers, for example, like Fifth Avenue, to take that as a symbol. Well, we should have a system of philosophical values that approves that and get rid of those philosophical values that conflict with that. That's our trouble. It's, <clears throat> you're thinking about food? Well, to my, I know that there is a great deal of fear about this subject. To my knowledge, I don't think that there is any problem of what goes on with our food, except perhaps to the extent that the government prevents the freedom of competition. It is to the self-interest of every producer to offer the best, most enjoyable food at the best prices. That's how he grows rich. If anyone can offer people more nutritious, better tasting food that is more economical, let him do so. He'll make a million dollars. You do not grow wealthy by selling people bad food or unnecessarily expensive food or whichever. And I would say that our system has provided people with the best food supply in the world. The average American is much better fed than the average person anywhere else because We've had freedom of farmers, food processors, retailers, etc., to make the highest possible profits. The government is trying to stop that. For example, 
if the government prevents farmers from using chemical fertilizers, if they adopted the ideals that some ecologists have, if they forced us to, re to revert to an earlier state of agricultural technology, then our food supply would have to be a lot worse. Yes? I suppose as you had more capital invested in an industry, the prices remained at the original level. That would not be likely because if the extra capital is stepping up productive facilities and you want to sell the extra output, you will only be able to find buyers at lower prices. But imagine a case for some reason where the price did not come down. Well, still the rate of profit would come down because first, you have more capital in the industry. There is no greater amount of profit in the industry. The amount of profit is at least no higher. So even if you had the same amount of profit but more capital, the rate of profit would be lower. But in addition, if you have more capital invested, the industry's total costs will almost certainly be higher because you'll have added depreciation on the extra capital and certain other costs, perhaps. So the rate of profit would still drop. During the 1920s, government income and outgo were either equal or there was a surplus. What factors then caused the inflation of the 1920s? All right, this is a good question. I'd like to say something about the connection between inflation and government deficits and surpluses. I perhaps could have included this issue as a critique of false explanations of inflation. Many people argue that deficits, per se, cause inflation, and they believe that surpluses, per se, are opposed to inflation. <clears throat> the fact is that deficits and surpluses in and of themselves are neutral with regard to inflation or the lack of it. Let's start with the issue of deficits first. If a government runs at a deficit and finances it by borrowing from the general public, the citizens and the business firms, no inflation is involved. It is simply the case that the citizens or the business firms spend less, they turn over their money to the government, which now spends for them. The total of demand is the same. What happens in a case of that kind is that after a little while, the government's debt begins to grow in relation to its revenues, the interest burden mounts, and it ends up like New York City. Now, <clears throat> New York City's deficits have not been inflationary. If anything, they would tend the other way. If, if because these deficits, if New York City went bankrupt, they could bring down banks, that would be deflationary. So a deficit per se is not inflationary. A deficit becomes inflationary when it is financed by the creation of new and additional money. The federal deficits are financed in part, not in whole, by the creation of new and additional money. So they are inflationary. Now, you could have the federal government operating at a surplus, and inflation could still go on. The way inflation could go on, with the government operating at a surplus, is the Federal Reserve System can simply create money and push this money out into the banking system and the rest of the economy, even while the federal government has a surplus. For example, suppose the federal government has a surplus, but even so, the Federal Reserve System is creating an extra few billion dollars, which it turns over to the banks, and the banks are enabled to create some more billions of dollars. Well, this is new and additional money, even while the federal government has a surplus. And this occurred 
in the 1920s. In the 1920s, the federal government had a surplus, but the Federal Reserve System was still expanding the quantity of money. One way that it did so was to go into the market and start to buy government bonds that had originally been issued in World War I. Now, you see, those are outstanding bonds. They don't represent any current deficit. But if the Federal Reserve buys them with newly created money, well, that's still injecting money. And this money that the Federal Reserve injected came to be held by the banking system, which could then create additional checking deposits and could make additional loans to business. Uh, there's a simple question. <clears throat> Does von Mises anywhere speak about the uniformity of profit principle? Well, von Mises doesn't always use, doesn't use the term profit in quite the same way I do, but he has an excellent essay on profits in his book, Planning for Freedom, Planning for Freedom, published by the Libertarian Press of South Holland, Illinois. And the essay is called Profit and Loss, and it is the base of many of the points that I developed tonight. So the essay, Profit and Loss. And also, if you uh, have a copy of Human Action, and you were to look up the sections on consumer sovereignty and profit and loss in human action, you would find the basic points, or most of the basic points that I've made. The uniformity of profit principle itself, there is an excellent presentation of this in the book of David Ricardo, which is available in the Everyman's edition, very inexpensively. It's the chapter on natural price and market price. Natural price and market price. I would recommend that chapter and von Mises on the subject of profits, and that would be a very good supplement to the second half of tonight's lecture. Now there is a question, is it true as Harry Brown claims, that the government must constantly increase the rate of inflation in order to prevent a deflation. Why? I believe that this is true to the extent that the inflation is in the form of what we described as fiduciary media in Lecture 1, and to the extent that it enters the economy in the form of new loans. Let's put a couple of points together. We saw tonight how the expansion of the money supply available for lending, how the additional availability of credit increased the velocity of circulation by putting businessmen in a position where they would draw down their cash holdings. Now let's add in another element that I didn't discuss tonight, but I'll mention now. And that is that you cannot increase the real credit available in an economy simply by increasing the quantity of money. When the quantity of money is increased and lent out, this creates the appearance of more capital, more credit available for lending. But what people are ultimately interested in, what the borrowers ultimately want, what businessmen ultimately want, is the ability to obtain machines, materials, the ability to employ labor. Now, merely by creating money, you cannot create additional physical capital goods. So what happens is, as the quantity of money is expanded and lent out, the appearance of greater credit availability is created, the velocity of circulation rises, but this new and additional money begins to raise wages and prices. And then what happens is that many businesses find that the capital funds at, at their disposal are inadequate to carry on the actual physical activities that they want to carry on. At that point, what happens is firms realize that they need more capital than they originally thought. What happens is 
borrowers realized they have to borrow more. People who could have been counted on to provide loans realize that they need the money in their own businesses. So what develops is a phenomenon called a quote, a quote, credit crunch, where credit suddenly becomes very unavailable because what has really happened is there is no additional real capital but just the appearance. Now, as credit becomes unavailable, then what happens is the low money holdings predicated on the seeming ease of credit turn out to be unfounded. When credit becomes unavailable that businessmen were counting on being available, then a need develops to rebuild cash holdings. So you just think, suppose you're a business, you have had a certain line of bank credit, you've been con conducting your operations on that basis, now your line of bank credit is unexpectedly canceled because the bank simply can't meet such heavy credit demands. Well, what are you to do? You have to try to rebuild your cash holding. So what happens is, when the additional money that enters the economy in the form of these new loans gets out into the economy and starts bidding up prices and wages, a credit crunch develops and a tendency would come into existence to reduce the velocity of circulation. And this would be a recession. Well, in order to prevent that from happening, the government has to provide another dose of more inflation. So in that sense, the process has to be continued and accelerated or it ends in a recession and then a deflation. Yes? I can't hear you. What use can be made of the knowledge and observation of the velocity of money? Well, I guess one use, you mean from a point of view of a business? Well, to simply explain, among other things, how as an inflation develops, the rise in spending becomes greater than the increase in the quantity of money. That's one factor. To explain how it is in a boom that businesses become overextended so that if the quantity of money stops expanding so rapidly, then the velocity has to fall. This precipitates a recession. So I think these are two implications. I'm sure there are others. Yeah? Does that explain what happened why some people in the 1920s blamed overproduction as a Would this explain why some people blamed overproduction as a cause of the depression of, the, of 1929? I don't see how anything about velocity could explain why people would think a depression is caused by overproduction. I think what makes people think that a depression is caused by overproduction is that they improperly generalize from the fact that if a particular product is produced in relative excess, the producers will suffer losses, as we saw tonight in various cases. But now, observe, what causes a loss is a relative overproduction which implies that elsewhere there is relative underproduction. It would not be possible for an economy as a whole to suffer from overproduction. Let's imagine, to take the most drastic possible case, suppose that tomorrow morning we could begin to produce double of everything with the same effort. This would not make all businesses unprofitable. It could only make half the businesses unprofitable. Now, you see, observe, what determines the total profits in the economy is simply the difference between the total spending of money to buy goods and the total money costs. If those two things stay the same, total profits have to stay the same. But now, observe, if we could double the production of everything, 
Would we want double the production of everything? Would we want double the production of bread or table salt? No. If those industries produce double, they'd have catastrophic losses. But could we use double the quantity of housing or automobiles when you allow for quality improvements? Well, yes, we could. Now, if we had an ability to produce double of everything, we wouldn't want to concentrate it producing double of everything. We produce the same amount of some things and much more than double of other things. Those other things would be profitable. But again, on this point, I refer you to that essay I mentioned earlier by James Mill, which is a very good account of, of this. And also, there are good discussions in the writings of John Stuart Mill. But I, I have very mixed feelings about John Stuart Mill because he ended his life as a socialist. Nevertheless, he has some good points on economics. So if you would look up in his book, Principles of Political Economy, which is reprinted. There are many great economic classics which are now available in reprints from Augustus M. Kelly of Clifton, New Jersey. A. M. Kelly of Clifton, New Jersey. You can obtain almost any of the great economic classics at a modest price in reprint form. Mr. Schwartz? Yes, I very, very much respect Henry Hazlitt. I think Henry Hazlitt is the greatest living economist. And I would have to say, without slighting anybody else, that I will only mention him because I consider him so far and above the others. I, I consider him to rank very high historically. I would consider him perhaps among the top 15 or 20. So if I don't mention others, that doesn't mean that uh, I necessarily think badly of them. It's just that I wouldn't consider them to be exceptional or really outstanding. Yes? You're asking, do I believe that the United States and the other advanced countries need, quote, more markets in the uh, undeveloped countries? Now, in fact, if what you mean by a market is simply the existence of consumers who will be good enough to take our goods, no. And here I'll recommend an article of my own called Production Versus Consumption, which appeared in the Freeman magazine in October 1964. The only benefit that any other country has to us, the only benefit it is to us, is not to the extent that it's willing to take our goods, but to the extent that it is able to supply us with goods. So we don't need foreign countries to be markets, we need them really to be sources of supply, and we will exchange our goods for the goods that they have. Uh, whatever resources they might have, that would be the value to us, not a willingness to take our goods. Nevertheless, there are many people, and this is an issue of Say's Law again, there are many people who do not realize that the key ingredient in trade is production, who believe that it's, it's simply money. People who do not realize that what counts in production, what counts in trade is production, have the idea that what we need is people to have needs. They think that we grow rich if we could find people with more needs. And that is usually the idea behind the belief that we, quote, need markets. 
we don't need needs. What we need is goods. And to the extent that people offer goods, well, then we can offer our goods. Now, would it be advantageous for us to trade with other areas in the world, such as the undeveloped countries? It definitely would be if they would let us. It would be to our interest not just to trade with them, but to develop them. It would be to our interest to invest tens of billions of dollars in those countries in developing them if they changed their value system and adopted the basic values and legal guarantees that have existed traditionally in the United States. If the countries of Africa, Asia, and Latin America respected property rights, if they did not nationalize property, if they guaranteed the property rights and the personal rights of their own citizens and foreign citizens, then it would, be pro it would be profitable to invest in those countries. But what do they do? No sooner does any appreciable investment occur than they nationalize it. Well, if they nationalize it, it's unprofitable to invest in those countries. So they perpetuate their own lack of development. Now, last week, uh, we had a discussion after the question, uh, in the question period, about whether or not uh, printing money and expanding demand could achieve full employment. And someone afterwards made the point to me that I appeared to concede that, that, I, that, my, that I said that it was very unlikely that simply stepping up demand could create employment, but that I appeared willing to concede the possibility of it and did not make any further objection to the policy of creating money to achieve full employment. Well, let me stress again that I do not believe that it is possible to achieve full employment that way. But I will also add now that even if it were possible, it would be very much less efficient and less desirable than achieving full employment through the free market process of letting prices and wages fall. Because observe, even if you could achieve additional employment through merely expanding government spending, still you are wasting capital in the process. The fact that you might put additional people to work does not change the fact that in producing anything, consumption occurs. Materials are used up, machinery is worn out, the workers involved are consuming goods. In order to make good this productive consumption, the consumption that is entailed in production, it is necessary that the product, in effect, replace the productive consumption. If you have a valueless product, or a product that is almost valueless, then while you may have more production in some sense, the production operates at a dead loss. See, so suppose we built a pyramid. Well, in building the pyramid, we would be consuming tremendous quantities of steel and concrete, all kinds of consumer goods that the workers would be using, and what would we have to show for it? A pyramid. We would have, we would have started with so much of real capital goods, and those real capital goods would be used up and replaced with a pyramid our economy would necessarily be poorer to that extent, even if it brought about full employment, which it certainly would not do. Now further, when the government does put people to work, and they can do it if they put them work to work for the government, if the government builds pyramids or courthouses in swamps or whatever, they can put people to work 
But such, quote, production is at the expense of the rest of the population and represents a loss. Because think of the fact, these previously unemployed workers are producing something that satisfies the whims of the government, a courthouse somewhere, or a pyramid. Now, where did the goods come from that the producers of the pyramid or unnecessary road consumed? Other people had to produce those goods. What can the other people receive in exchange? Nothing. Their output goes to the re-employed. The output of the re-employed goes to the government. Nothing comes to them. It's a dead loss, a broken circle. Let me give you an analogy. I could employ this gentleman sitting in the front row, assuming he had no job. Now, if we look at that in the whole economy, we could say there's one extra person working. But if I employ him, and he has to be paid, but I send the bill for his employment to the people over here, well, his employment is a loss to them. And it's a bigger loss if, instead of having him rake leaves in a park somewhere, where the only cost is his wages, if I have him build a road that I don't need, and I send the bill for the road, well, then the cost is that much greater. So the only kind of employment the government could achieve, essentially, is public works employment, which is a dead loss, worse than if they simply had the people on relief, because the people on relief aren't at least using materials for houses or what have you. Now, I think I'm going to have to call a halt here, simply because my voice won't hold up. But we will continue in two weeks, and maybe we'll get to some of these other questions. <laughs>